1 Peter chapter 1, verses 6 and 7. Peter addressed this epistle to the sojourners of the dispersion. Many scholars believe that it was not just the Jewish dispersion that he was speaking about. After Titus had destroyed Jerusalem and those that remained were dispersed throughout the world, But the Christians who were dispersed as a result of the persecution against the church. In the days of the early Christianity, during periods of the Roman Empire, it was a capital crime to be a Christian. Now, someone has ventured the question, had you lived in that period and you were arrested for being a Christian, could they get enough evidence on you to convict you? It was a capital crime. It is estimated that as many as six million Christians were put to death in the first two centuries of the early church. Six million in the first two centuries. And yet, under the persecution, the church thrived. It grew. It prospered. It wasn't until the persecution ceased and they tried to make Christianity the popular religion and the state religion that the church began to wane and became weakened. So Peter is writing to those that have been dispersed, no doubt because of the persecution, for as we get into verses 6 and 7, he speaks about the tribulations, the trials that they are enduring. First of all, speaking to them of that living hope, the cause for thanking God, praising God for the living hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance that is incorruptible and undefiled, that fades not away, that is reserved in heaven for you who are kept by the power of God through faith. I think I hear a baby in the service, and we would like to have you take it to the nursery if you would, wherever that baby may be. This inheritance that is incorruptible, undefiled, that fades not away, that is reserved in heaven for you, wherein ye greatly rejoice. The Christian experience is an experience of joy. One of the characteristics of the Christian life is always that of joy and rejoicing. Now, if we only had joy and we only rejoiced when we had won the Irish sweepstakes or the drawing at the local grocery store, then what would be, we be different from any other person? You can turn on television and watch when they say, and you have won, you know, and you see them 
scream and squeal and jump up and down and, and show many signs of great ecstatic joy. So what? They've just won. Anybody can rejoice when they're a winner. And having joy in the time of victory, in the time of prosperity, in the time of blessing is no witness at all. Even as Jesus said, loving those that love you, what? You know, the, the, the heathen do that. And if you only th love those that love you, what do you do more than they do? And the intimation of Jesus Christ is that you should be doing more than they do because of what he has done for you. So, We as Christians are a peculiar lot because we have joy even in the midst of trials, even in the midst of persecution. And in these days, when Peter is writing these words to the Christians, They were manifesting the joy of the Lord in all kinds of adverse situations. And actually the joy by which the Christian lived, even in great persecution, was a powerful witness to the world. There are many beautiful stories of the early Christian martyrs who, through their attitude in the face of death, that of joy rejoicing, singing hymns together as they stood in the center of the arena while the lions were being loosed, worshiping and praising the Lord was such a powerful impact upon the pagan world. And many of them just could not handle it. And many converts were added to the church because of the joy that the Christian, early Christian, had even in terrible persecution. Wherein, that is, in this living hope that we have, of this in Inheritance that is incorruptible and undefiled and fades not away, wherein ye rejoice greatly, though now for a season, if need be, you are in heaviness through the manifold temptations. Even though at the present moment you're going through extreme trials, Yet we rejoice, but the rejoicing is not for the trial, but it is a rejoicing in the trial, but it is a rejoicing for the hope that we have in Christ Jesus. Now there is a certain idiocy that some people are trying to proclaim that you should just rejoice for everything. Not so. There are many things for which we are very sad. We look at this corrupt, sinful world. I can't rejoice for this corrupt, sinful world. I'm sad for the world and the calamity that is bringing upon itself. Jesus, when he could foresee the calamity that was coming upon Jerusalem, wept over it. 
He wasn't rejoicing because of the calamity that they were going to be facing. But he wept when he saw by the Spirit into the future the children being dashed in the streets. He wept. And there are many things over which we weep as we see a world that is twisted in a world that is perverted in a world that is not in alignment with God's order. And we see the calamity that results. My rejoicing is in the Lord and in the promises of the Lord and in the inheritance that I have in Christ Jesus that is incorruptible, undefiled, and phased not away, reserved in heaven for me. I rejoice in that. The fact that God has given to me this glorious hope. I don't rejoice in the conditions of the world today. I weep over them. So, we greatly rejoice, though now for a season. If need be, we are in heaviness through the manifold temptations or trials. Heaviness for a season. Now, this is in contrast to this inheritance that is incorruptible and undefiled and fades not away and reserved in heaven. You see, that's the eternal joys that are promised to me through Christ Jesus. Now, for the time being, as Paul the Apostle said in 2 Corinthians 5, we who are in this body do often groan earnestly desiring to be delivered from this body, not to be an unembodied spirit, but to be clothed upon with the body which is from heaven. God does not deny us our natural emotions. God does not intend that we be stoics, that we not feel Some people have some kind of a concept that they feel guilty if they cry at the death of a loved one. Or if you cry over a hardship or a problem or a, a, a difficult situation that you're facing. God doesn't seek to deny you your natural emotions. We do cry at the death of our loved ones. But our sorrow is not as those who have no hope. Though there is sorrow, and that is natural. And God does not seek to deny you your natural feelings, your natural emotions. And so, when we are going through tribulation, when we are going through these trials, there is a heaviness that we go through for a season. We do go through some deep waters. Yet, the bottom line is that as I look out and look ahead at the glorious promises of God, my soul rejoices even though presently I am feeling this terrible burden and this great heaviness because of the situation I am in. Yet I look on out a ways and I say, oh, bless God. One of these days, I'm going to be freed from the limitations of this old corrupt body. I'm going to be with him. I'm going to receive my inheritance. 
dwelling with him. So we greatly rejoice. Now, this word rejoice is used just one other place, the Greek word in the New Testament, and that is where Jesus said, count it all joy. No, beg your pardon. Um, thinking of another scripture. Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew, the fifth chapter, about verse 10 or 12 there, he said, Blessed are ye when men revile you and persecute you and say all manner of things against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice. Now literally in the Greek this actually bespeaks an exuberant joy and literally in the Greek it is jump for joy when men persecute you and revile you and say all manner of evil against you falsely for Christ's sake. Now if you hear that someone's going around spreading the story at work, hey, did you hear what happened to him? He went down to the church and he's become a Jesus freak. How about that? And they begin to, you know, pour salt on your sandwiches when you're in the <laughs> other room. And they begin to do all kinds of things to get you to react so they can say, oh, oh, oh look at that. He's supposed to be a Christian. <laughs> Just see. <laughs> And you start receiving persecution. Now so often our response isn't that of jumping for joy. It's jumping often in anger saying, I'll get even with you, you know. Rejoice. Wherein we greatly rejoice. Though if now for a season, if needs be, we're in manifold, heavy temptations. Knowing this, that the trial of your faith being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried by fire. Now, The <laughs> word precious is one of Peter's favorite words. And to me, this is very interesting because Peter was a big, rough, tough fisherman. Peter was the guy who was ready to fight at the drop of a hat. He's the guy that's got the sword ready and he's swinging before anybody else can get theirs out of the sheath. Tough. Big. And yet when Christ gets hold of his life, his favorite word becomes precious. <laughs> Somehow I don't associate that word with a big, tough, burly fisherman. And yet it shows you the glorious power of the grace of God. And so we find, and you will notice, and it might be uh, interesting for you to do as I did, underline in Peter's epistles the number of times he uses this word precious. And here he speaks that the trial of our faith is more precious than gold. Now, gold is known as one of the precious metals. Because of the rarity, tremendous value, and of course, nowadays, 
the value is on a fluctuating scale, but it is certainly elevated from what it was when it was under government control. But the trial of your faith, the testing of your faith, is more precious than gold, which perishes. Now, gold is going to perish. But the inheritance that you have is incorruptible. It is undefiled, and it fadeth not away. The trial of my faith now is important for my growth and for my development. An athlete puts his body through tremendous rigor, exercise, especially if he is training for the Olympics. You have to run until it hurts, and then you have to keep running. You've got to push your body and continue to push your body. Now, the purpose isn't to destroy your body. The purpose is to develop your body. For the more you push yourself, the more developed your body becomes. So the pushing of yourself to the limit and then beyond isn't to destroy, but it's to build up your stamina. Now, the trial of your faith isn't to destroy your faith. It's to build up your faith. And God seeks to build up your faith. And so there are the testings of the faith. There are the times when our faith is tried for the purpose that we might discover that God is faithful and God is true. And sometimes my faith is pressed to the limit and beyond. There are times when it is pressed beyond, when I've actually given up. And I thought, oh, well, God is not going to come through on this one. He had his chance, and he's missed it. It is time for me to work, oh, Lord. <laughs> Instead of as David, it is time for thee to work, oh, Lord. But there always seems to be in our minds that time when God had his chance and now it's too late, I've got to do something about it. And I have found that even many times when I had gone beyond what I thought was the limit, trusting and waiting upon the Lord to work and when he didn't and going beyond that point when I thought, well, I've got to then do something about it, that God has still come through and God has provided. I'm here tonight. Now, there were many times when I didn't think I would be here tonight. I thought I was through a long time ago. But here I am. I am here because God has brought me here. God has brought me this far. God has taken care of me. God has delivered me. God has blessed me. God has had his hand upon me. Were it not for the hand of God upon my life, I would not be here tonight. There is a psalm that said, if it had not been that the Lord was on our side, let all of Israel now say, if it had not been that the Lord was on our side, surely we would have been destroyed by our enemies. If it had not been that God was strengthening us and helping us and sustaining us, surely 
we would have fallen long ago. But the Lord has held us up. The Lord has sustained us. Even when we didn't have the strength or the ability or the sense, yet God intervened. Now, as the result of seeing that intervening work of God in our past lives, our faith having been tested, the faith having been tried, the faith is developed so that we don't have the same degree of panic that we used to have in the earlier experiences of our lives. When Kay and I first started out in the ministry, we received $15 a week salary. Our rent was $55 a month. On the apartment, the church did give us $40. So one of our week's salary had to go to supplement the difference between the church paid for our rent and what we had to pay. And things were often tough. There were many times when we didn't know where dinner was coming from. Most of the time, God provided through a letter in the post office. $5 bill, $5 check, $10 bill. Sometimes there would be groceries left on our front porch. We never went without a meal. God always provided. Never once did we go without a meal. I've heard a lot of stories of ministers who lived on beans. And we never once had a meal of just beans, though I thought we were going to. <laughs> I had read the story of George Mueller who, when he began pastoring, refused to take any salary. He wanted to just live on faith completely, and I was inspired by that. And though I had a salary of $15 a week, I thought I had it a little over George, but yet we decided not to work, but just to live by faith and trust the Lord to supply our needs. And there our faith was tested, many times tested. But God always came through. As I look back upon my life and the development of my spiritual walk, I believe that those six months that Kay and I spent in Prescott, Arizona were probably the most valuable six months in our ministry uh, where we really were learning basic lessons of faith as our faith was being tested and we were discovering the faithfulness of God. And having learned to trust God for our daily bread, and I might say that my wife was born to the purple. She had never eat margarine, even when we were $15 a week. We had to have butter. And, and she was always one that 
quality foods, no cheap stuff. And so we ate well. It wasn't my faith. I have faith for margarine, but... <laughs> but the testing of the faith is more precious than gold. It becomes more valuable to us than gold could ever become. The faith that God develops in your life is worth much more than gold. Gold is going to perish. But the faith bringing you into that eternal inheritance that is incorruptible and undefiled, that fades not away. So the faith that God has wrought in you is so precious, so valuable, because it opens the door for you, for all that God has, for his riches of his kingdom. And so we look ahead and we rejoice greatly in the glorious hope that we have, though presently manifold temptations, but we know that the trial of our faith is more precious than gold. Now, gold is put through a trial also. Gold is put through the fire. And the purpose of putting the gold through the fire is that the dross may come to the surface and they might clean off the dross. So it's heated till it becomes molten. And the dross then begins to... And they keep pulling the dross off of the top until finally... The goldsmith can see the reflection of his face in the gold. And then he knows that it is pure. And so God puts the fire under us. He allows the testings. He allows the trials. And the old junk breaks loose, comes to the surface. And God keeps taking the slag off until finally he looks and he sees his reflection in us and he knows we've been purified. The trial of your faith more precious than gold that perisheth even though it is tried in the fire that it might be found unto the praise and the honor and the glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. So the testings are that we, when Christ appears, might be found to his praise, to his glory, to his honor. God created you in order that he might receive praise and glory and honor from you. Now that is not just a verbal praise and a verbal glory that God is looking for. God is looking for that inward glory. The same feeling that I have when I look at my son or I look at my daughter and I see them in a commitment to the Lord Jesus Christ. I see them loving the Lord and serving the Lord, and I feel so good inside. 
I just think, ah, right, you know. And God wants to be able to look at you and say, all right. As he sees your love and your devotion and your commitment unto him, God receives glory from your life, from what you are from your obedience. And as he sees you walking that way, it just, it gives him glory. It gives him that, as Paul said, to the praise of the glory of his grace. And that's our purpose, that God might receive glory and honor and praise from the way we live in fellowship with him unto the appearing of Jesus Christ. Now, I believe that we are living in one of the most exciting ages in the history of man. It is my deep personal conviction that I, barring an accident, will have the privilege of being caught up to meet Christ in the air, the rapture of the church. I believe I am living in that generation. I believe that with all of my heart. I could be wrong. But I believe that with all of my heart. I also believe that I am living, and we are living, in one of the most difficult periods of history to live a truly dedicated, committed Christian life. I do not believe that the worldly influences have ever been stronger in the history of man. I believe that it is harder to live for Jesus Christ now than it was in the days when they were feeding the Christians to the lions. I do believe that a lot of us have that kind of commitment and tenacity that we would be willing to die for Jesus Christ. In fact, I don't see dying for Jesus Christ as much of a big problem. I think the big problem is living for Jesus Christ in a degenerate age when the pressures of the world are so strong, when the mores of our society are so corrupt, Jesus spoke of these days as being difficult days. In fact, he even questioned when the Son of Man returns, will he find faith on the earth? Living in an age of materialism, living in a society of opulence, does not really help in living a dedicated, Christian, committed life. Jesus, speaking of the last days, said, Because the iniquity in the earth shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. And how the iniquity in the world around us is abounding. And we see men going deeper and deeper into the moral quagmire 
sinking lower than what you could even imagine or think a man could go in depravity. We see the horrors of our society. We see movies that portray incestual relationships. And we know and we read of so many cases of children abused by their parents, not only physically but many times sexually. Unthinkable. And in this decadent age, when there are so many pressures upon us to let down the standard, to lower our standards, it isn't easy to hold the high standard that is required in the Word of God. And as we see the day of Christ approaching so fast and the pressures become greater and our exposure to them becomes all the greater because of the modern day media of communicating. We are exposed daily from the media to so many things that the whole tendency, the whole purpose is that of breaking down, destroying the moral fiber, integrity, purity. And our faith is being tested. And our faith will be tested. But oh, thank God for the testing. Because we need to be strong in these days. If we're going to be to the honor and the glory and the praise at his appearing. John tells us lest we should be ashamed at his appearing. And there are many, unfortunately, of you. Unless you change, could very well be very ashamed at the appearing of Jesus Christ. For he's coming in an hour in which you think not. He may come in that very moment that you finally gave in to the weakness of your flesh and you decided to go ahead and do that which you knew was wrong and what shame you will have at his appearing. But God is testing our faith. His purpose is not to destroy you. His purpose is to develop that faith, to make you strong so that when he does appear, we might have that glory and honor and we might enter into that inheritance that is reserved in heaven for us. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for the testing of our faith, for the fiery trials 
which are to try us. Whereby, Lord, there might be developed that purity within. Lord, we surely rejoice tonight as we look forward with great joy to your coming again and delivering us out of this present evil world with all of its temptations, all of its pressures. But, oh God, Help us that we will be accounted faithful, that we will be accounted worthy to escape all these things that are coming to pass upon the earth and that we might be standing before thee. So, Lord, we ask that you would put our faith to the test. that it might develop, that we might find you faithful, that we might be strong, that we might be to your praise and honor and glory at your appearing. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Shall we stand? May the Lord be with you and watch over and keep you. May he anoint you with his Holy Spirit and may you experience that glorious joy. Even though it may be you're going through a heavy situation, all kinds of pressure, take it as an opportunity of growth. Commit yourself and thrust yourself upon the Lord. He might do his work. The Lord bless thee, Lord bless thee and keep thee. Keep thee. The, Lord the Lord make his face to shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee, and be gracious unto thee. The Lord lift up his countenance upon thee and give thee 